Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Meg Pierce. I'm the executive director of the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the kickoff event of our 2023 voter education series, Ballot Box Basics. For your awareness, this webinar is being recorded. However, as you are an attendee on this webinar, your camera is turned off, so your face will not be included in the recording. A reminder that closed captioning is available in Zoom. To enable closed captions on your screen, click Live Transcript in your Zoom taskbar. If you need more assistance with closed captioning, we are dropping a help document into the chat. And as always, if we can improve accessibility for you in any way, please let us know in the chat. Uh, slide before, please. Thank you. So we're going to begin tonight with a land acknowledgement. Tori, you can go forward. Thank you. We begin our time together with a land acknowledgement. Colonial Pennsylvania boundaries were first drawn in 1681 over original nation's land. We in Pennsylvania acknowledge the land ownership of original indigenous peoples, honoring the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the great nations of Pennsylvania, Erie, Erie Iroquois, Munsee, Delaware, Shawnee, Ohio Valley, Susquehannock, and Lenape. We honor all original nations of the past and those among us today. Next slide, please. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we're so happy to be bringing you this event tonight. A little bit about us. Our state office oversees a grassroots network of 31 local leagues all across Pennsylvania. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. To learn more about our work, and to subscribe to our action alerts, please visit our website. We'll drop those links in the chat now. Next slide. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to Ballot Box Basics, information every voter needs. We designed these webinars because we know that voting, government, and elections can be a little bit complicated. In 2023, these monthly webinars will discuss important <coughs> topics like registering to vote, why municipal elections matter, the role of school boards and the judiciary, and the Pennsylvania closed primary system. Whether you're a first time voter or if you voted in every election that you were eligible for, we think you'll learn something new tonight. We have all previous recordings of Ballot Box Basics available on our website. So we'll drop that link in the chat. You can also sign up for future events there. So tonight's event, what we're here to discuss is the importance of municipal elections. Through the presentation, you are welcome and encouraged to ask questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. We will leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. You are welcome to also engage with your fellow participants in the chat, but please know that we will only be answering questions using the Q&A function. In addition to a recording of tonight's event, please note that we will send a copy of all the slides to registrants. You don't have to worry about memorizing anything. All right, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce my co-presenters. First, I'm pleased to welcome Crystal Knight of Vote Riders, which is a nonprofit organization that provides critical free information and help with voter ID in all US states. In addition to serving as the Pennsylvania organizer for Vote Riders, Crystal serves on the executive board of the Pittsburgh chapter of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. The daughter of immigrant parents, Crystal is a queer, second generation Mexican American organizer born and raised in Houston, Texas. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Texas A&M University. Crystal, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'll also introduce Rochelle Kaplan, the League's Director of Voter Services. Rochelle is, an, is a retired attorney and mediator in labor and employment disputes for the private, education, and public sectors. During her professional career, she also assisted organizations in their strategic planning, serving manufacturing, real estate, and nonprofit organizations. Her work with the League began when she became a member of the League of Women Voters of Lehigh County in 2017. 
She was appointed our Director of Voter Services in 2022, and we're so grateful for all the incredible work that she does for our organization. Rochelle believes that voter education is foundational work of the League, and it's all the more important now because of the level of misinformation that abounds on social media. Thank you both so much for being here. Rochelle, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Joy, we can go to the next slide. So I always like to start to remind people why we vote. I mean, that is who the League of Women Voters is. And the quote from Abraham Lincoln reminds us that it's our <clears throat> right to vote that powers us. So just to be qualified or registered doesn't do it. When you get out to vote, you've got power. Of course, it's the foundation of democracy, but it's your voice. It's your ability to hold politicians accountable. It's your ability to try and make change. And every vote matters. Those of us in Lehigh County will remember in 2021, there was a common pleas court race that was won by five votes. Five votes, people. So if six more people would have voted, maybe the other person would have won. So just remember that this is such a powerful tool that you have for change. We can go to the next slide. Now in Pennsylvania, we get to vote every year, twice a year. There are no off-year elections. There are elections on even years, which is federal, state, and presidential. And there are elections in odd number years. And that's our municipal elections and our statewide judicial elections. And these elections, are important at a very granular level. The people that you elect to these positions affect your day-to-day -day life. Now we haven't had much snow here in at least Lehigh County, but snow removal, trash removal, election administration, if you're concerned about the number of drop boxes that you may have, in your community or the judicial system, the police criminal justice system. These are the positions. You can't contact your federal or state rep to handle the curriculum in your school board. And I just wanna mention something else before we go to the next slide. I did a little digging and in Lehigh County, because the state doesn't have these statistics, in 2021, only 30% of the registered voters voted in the general municipal election. That means that only three out of your 10 neighbors bothered to vote for your mayor, your county commissioner, your township supervisor as opposed to in 2022, close to 60% of the people voted in these elections. Let's go to the next slide and we're gonna talk about some of the very important issues that these people that you're going to be electing have a say over. Local county taxes. I'm sure all of you hear from neighbors and friends alike about the county, city, municipal, and school taxes, the burden that is on them. Well, once again, it is the people in your local government that are making these decisions. Community service, police, firefighters, child care, child abuse, elder care, prison system, criminal justice infrastructure, 
roads, bridges, sewers in your neighborhood. I hear a lot about zoning, uh, farmland preservations, trying to stop warehousing. It's not your state rep or your federal rep or the president. It is your local zoning board. And those people are picked by your township supervisors. I touched on election administration. And finally, your school board, education policy, education facilities, the labs, the buildings, the local people that you elect handle all of these important issues. If you care about any of them, these are the elections that will make the difference for you. Now we're putting in the chat two articles that I found very interesting. One from Harvard that talks in general about the importance of municipal elections. And what, another one that just recently appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer that talks about election administration and how these elections, who you elect the county commissioner level could impact how elections will be run in 2024. I recommend highly both articles. So let's go to the next slide and we're gonna talk about what you're gonna see on your ballot. Now, some of these positions depends on the size of the municipality that you live in, but all of you will have county wide races to vote for. Those are your county commissioners in certain counties. Uh, like Lehigh, we have a county executive that might be on your ballot. Lehigh County doesn't have it this year, but I believe Allegheny County has a county executive on their ballot this year. The courts, you could have trial court or magisterial judges. Also row offices. Now what are row offices? That is your DA, your county controller, your clerk of judicial rest records, your coroner, your register of wills. Those are considered row offices. If you live in a city, you're gonna have a mayor, your council members. Cities also have row officers. I know in Allentown, we have a city controller as well as a county controller. If you live in a township, you're gonna either have supervisors or commissioners. These are the people that deal with zoning, in particular, if you're concerned about zoning. If you live in a smaller municipality, you're gonna have a borough mayor and borough council people. And finally, last but certainly not least, are all of the school boards that are in your county. Depending on what school district you are in, you will see people running for school board. Now, as you can see, your ballot is gonna be very lengthy. And when we get to filling out your ballot, I'm gonna remind you that it's going to be very lengthy and you may even have to turn it over on the back to get all of the candidates. To be clear, these are the people that handle all of the issues on the other slide that we just discussed. Can we go to the next slide? Now I briefly mentioned judiciary. So this year you will have three statewide races, and that's in our appellate courts. If you can see on our little pyramid there, the appellate courts are the top and the two, the one top Supreme Court, and then the Superior Court and the Commonwealth Court. They're considered appellate courts. This year, the Supreme Court has one vacancy, the Superior Court has two vacancies and the Commonwealth Court has one vacancy. So you're gonna see candidates 
for those three positions. Those are the only statewide positions you're gonna see on your ballot. The next level is the Court of Common Pleas. In your county, you could have vacancies in that level. Those are your trial, that's your trial courts. They handle civil matters, divorce matters, criminal matters. Below them, and when I say below, I mean in the, in the amount of, of um, when they handle the magisterial district judges, getting a little tongue tied here, handle criminal matters and civil matters, but not as the munis the civil matters are less than $12,000 value. And the criminal matters are the preliminary stages, preliminary hearings and bail. We can go to the next slide. Perfect, primary elections. So we vote, as I said, twice a year. Primary elections is our first. It's called primary for a reason. These are the elections that determine who's gonna be on the ballot in the general election. This year it's May 16th. Now, as Meg mentioned, unfortunately, we only have a closed primary system. So that means that in voting for candidates, you have to be either a registered Republican or Democrat and your ballot will reflect Republican or Democrat candidates, except third bullet says some candidates cross file. So in school board races, in magisterial justice races, and in court of common pleas, they can cross file. And the theory behind that was these positions should not be partisan. So while every other candidate on your ballot will be a Democrat or Republican, depending on which registration you're at, those positions could be either, which kind of makes our closed primary system a little crazy. So if you're registered independent or third party, you're not able to vote in the primary unless there's a referendum on your ballot. At this point, there are no statewide referendums, but your county may have a referendum on the ballot or the city. Now, let me just stop here for a second. Primary elections, especially in municipals, end up being the final election because there's no opposition. So what's really unfortunate is the lack of voter turnout. In 2021 in Lehigh County, depending on where you were, 15 to 20% of the registered Republicans and Democrats showed up to vote. And think about it, because we exclude members that are registered independent, the number of registered voters that voted in that primary were minuscule because you had to reduce the total number by the number of independents. So when I say primary elections are important, if you are registered Republican or Democrat, get out there and vote. On May 1st, we're gonna be having a deep dive into our closed primary system. Next slide. So that brings us to the general, that's November 7th, and everybody can vote and you can vote for everybody. Um, doesn't matter what party you're in, you can vote for anybody on your ballot. So let's move to who gets to vote in these elections. Well, in Pennsylvania, we can go to the next slide. We have really simple registration qualifications. You have to be 18 years on election day, you have to be a citizen of the United States, and you have to be a resident of the state and the district for 30 days. College students can register at their home address or the campus address. Now, because we don't have time for this, we're dropping in the chat 
voting rights of currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals in Pennsylvania. With some exceptions, they have a right to register and to vote. So we're dropping the Department of State link so that you could learn more about the rights of those folks. Next slide, please. We make registration incredibly easy. You can go online, you can buy mail, you know, print out and mail in your registration. You can go to your voter registration office and also PennDOT and some other government agencies. You have to register 15 days prior to the election for the May primary, it's May 1st. Next slide. So how do we vote in Pennsylvania? We vote two ways, by mail and in person. I'm gonna start with by mail. We have no excuse and absentee ballots. What happens is you can apply online or in person up to seven days prior to the election. But let me say this for the voter registration offices, please, 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 please don't wait till seven days prior to the election. Do it now. It takes a lot of time to process these. I also wanna point out, and, and Crystal's gonna talk more about voter ID, but when anybody says to you, well, to vote by mail, you don't need voter ID. That is an incorrect statement. In your application to get your mail-in ballot, you have to put either your social security number, your driver's license, or you have to make a photocopy of one of the valid forms of voter ID and it, attach it to um, your application. This permits the people in voter registration to make sure you are who you are and that you are registered to vote. But I'm gonna let Crystal um, in a few minutes talk to you more about voter ID. Next slide. So your county voter registration office will be sending you a ballot once the ballot is finalized. Typically, it's no more than 50 days before the election. Sometimes it's even less than that. This is a wonderful slide that um, Meg put together. I absolutely adore it. I'm just gonna say three things. Read the instructions. Read the instructions, read the instructions. The other two things I'm going to say is, please, 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 after you make your ballot choices, Put your ballot in the secrecy envelope. Put that secrecy envelope in the larger mailer and please sign and date your ballot. Because if you don't put it in the secrecy envelope and you don't sign and date the larger envelope, your ballot could be not counted. In 2022, there was a lot of, I think I, saw something maybe 15,000 votes were not counted. Each county makes their own decisions whether they're going to accept these ballots or not, or whether they're gonna contact the voter to cure the ballot if it's not signed or dated. So don't even worry about it. Sign and date your ballot. You can drop your ballot off if your county permits drop boxes, or you can put it in the mail, or you can take it down to your voter registration office. If you use a drop box, please, please, please just drop yours off. Those are the rules right now. So I'm just underscoring that. All right, voting at the polls. The polls are open from seven o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night. A poll worker, and I'm honored to be one at Weisenberg Township, are democracy's essential workers. They're the ones 
that makes your, your voting experience is smooth, pleasant, uninterrupted. You don't face intimidation. The voting machines that you use, and you can look at your voting machine system by going onto your county's um, voter registration or go to the Department of State and they'll link you to your county. But every single voting machine in Pennsylvania has to have a paper record of your vote. The machine is not connected to the internet and it is locked, safe, and secure. There is a chain of custody from the time your ballot is scanned into the machine until it reaches um, your voter registration office. So now, because I touched upon some voter ID, I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal from Vote Riders, who's going to talk more about it. Hello everyone and happy International Women's Day. My name is Crystal Martha Knight. I use she, her pronouns. I am the Pennsylvania organizer for Vote Riders. And while I'm based in Pittsburgh, my territory covers the whole Commonwealth. So I might be in a town near you soon. And I'm here just to quickly tell, tell you all about who Vote Writers is, what we do, and how you can help bridge the gap in the voting process. So just to um, get, us, get us started, um, Vote Writers is a national, nonpartisan, nonprofit, and our mission is to ensure that no eligible voter is prevented from casting a ballot that counts due to voter ID laws, either directly from lack of acceptable ID or indirectly because of voter confusion. You know, Vote Writers educates voters and assists citizens to secure their voter ID. So that's us on paper, but just a little bit more about us. Um, we're going to be celebrating 11 years next, next year since we were founded in 2012. We operate in these lovely states, Arizona, Florida, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, Wisconsin, most recently are um, looking to hire someone for Ohio because they just passed some of the strictest voter ID laws in the country. And of course, we're here in Pennsylvania. So who we work with, um, we work with any organization, honestly, who will who is willing to let us set up shop and host a voter ID clinic on site. So that will be shelters, food banks, reentry programs, universities, high schools, barber shops, democracy organizations. You know, again, anybody who understands our nonpartisan hat and is willing to let us work with them, we're happy to partner together. And what it is that we exactly do is we help people directly apply for and most importantly pay for their IDs, their driver's licenses, their birth certificates. For the trans and non-binary community, we also um, help apply and pay for their gender and name mark changes on IDs and birth certificates. For women who have changed their name, we can also uh, apply and pay for the marriage certificates or divorce decrees in, for, in order for them to prove who they are. And so with this, um, we are really, like I mentioned earlier, closing a gap in the voting process. We have this huge push, which is so important every year for voter registration, getting everybody up to date on their voter registration. Um, and then, of course, right before the election, we have GOTV, get out the vote, getting everybody to the polls. But there is that step of whether or not people actually have the ID they need if they're a first time voter um, or if they move from one precinct to the other. So you might be asking, well, how exactly do we do this? We do this with, with um, volunteer help. We do this, we, we are lucky in Pennsylvania to have two staff folks. Um, but we can't do this alone. So a lot of what we are doing right now is revamping our training program. Um, you can find all of our information at our wonderful website, votewriters.org. Um, and while we do have opportunities for in-person um, voter ID clinics in Pittsburgh currently and upcoming in Philadelphia, the vast majority of the work that we do happens online um, or over the phone. So no matter where you are in Pennsylvania, if this is something that you think that would be up your alley. We would love to work with you um, because we, again, we really rely on, uh, on our on our community to step up to help get this work done. And while I'll say ultimately our goal is that everybody we help um, goes out and, and cast a ballot that counts, we know that for so many people, 
an ID is so much more than just their ticket to the to the um, voting booth. It it helps them with housing. It helps with employment. Even just to get healthcare in the state, you have to have ID. So um, an ID, the help to get that ID helps what well beyond um, voting day. Um, and so I would love to go to the next slide so I can actually tell you guys what our IDs are. So in Pennsylvania right now. Um, the photo IDs that are acceptable are our driver's licenses and our state IDs, which must be unexpired. But of course, any ID issued by the Pennsylvania Commonwealth or the U.S. government, including U.S. passports, military ID, and student ID, including an employee ID. But we we refer to Pennsylvania as a semi-strict um, state because we also have um, non-photo ID options, which would be on the next slide. Um, so you can use your voter registration card, and again, IDs issued by the Pennsylvania Commonwealth or the U.S. government. You can use a firearm permit or even a current utility bill or bank statement or paycheck. So we are, we, we always know that there's, there's always potential changes that might come down the line with when it comes to voter ID here in Pennsylvania. So that's why we're here ready to get this work done so that everybody has a chance to vote. Um, but I will pass it back to Rochelle. Thank you so much. I think we're passing it to Meg. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you, Rochelle, for all of that wonderful, really informative information. So I'm here to talk about your rights as a voter. Um, so first and foremost, you should know that any voter who is in line to vote by 8 p.m. on election day is allowed to vote. So as long as you get there and you stand in line before the polls close, you are allowed to vote. So if the polls close while you stay in line, for example, maybe it's 8.05, uh, but you're still in line, stay in line because you have the right to vote. Another good thing to know about your rights as a voter is that if you make a mistake on your ballot, you are allowed to ask for a new one. And if the machines are down at your polling place, you can ask for a paper ballot. That's another one of your rights as a voter. And finally, if there's an issue um, you know, determining your eligibility at the polls, for example, maybe you haven't brought the right kind of ID or um, an election worker just isn't sure of your eligibility, you can always ask to vote by a provisional ballot. So these are all of your rights for election day. Next slide, please. There's a lot of really wonderful resources that Pennsylvanians have access to um, as voters. The first is um, if you notice that you're having some accessibility needs at your polling place, uh, or you know a friend or family member that has accessibility needs at a polling place, you can call our partner organization, Disability Rights PA. This is their hotline number, and they are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on election days. And again, we will be sharing all of this information in a follow-up email, so you don't have to worry about writing down this information right now. And finally, if you have any kind of problems or any questions on election day, you can also call the election protection hotline. That information is available in multiple languages, and we have each of the phone numbers for individual languages below. Next slide, please. Rochelle already went over many of these important dates for the 2023 election, but I just wanted to go over them one more time. So for the primary election, which is the next election coming up in May, the deadline to register to vote is May 1st. However, don't delay. Registering to vote is not a time consuming activity, and we encourage you to register as soon as possible. Then, if you would like to vote by mail, there's a deadline to request your mail in ballot, and that is May 9th. But again, to avoid any possible delays, for example, with the U.S. Postal Service, request your mail-in ballot as soon as possible. Again, on election day is May 16th, with the polls open between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. And one final note about mail ballots, that they must be received by 8 p.m. on election day. And received, as, you know, as Rochelle indicated, could be by mail, could be in person at your county election office, or a ballot drop box if your county has those. Next slide, please. So there's so many resources available to you as voters. The first is vote411.org, which is the league's one-stop shop for all your voting needs. 
this is really, um, as Rochelle calls it, the crown jewel of the league. <laughs> because all you have to do is enter your address and it will tell you not only what's on your ballot, but who's on your ballot, where your polling place location is, how to register to vote, and how to request a mail-in ballot. It even will tell you if there's any candidate forums in your area. Next is vote.pa.gov, which is the PA Department of State's website on election information. It's incredibly comprehensive. I encourage everyone to go and have a look around. Next is our nonprofit uh, website, lwvpa.org. So we also have all the information that you can need as a voter on our website. Next, we have Open Secrets and factcheck.org. So we find these to be really effective nonpartisan tools when it comes to, say, tracking money that your candidates have received, and then also for just non-biased political fact-checking about maybe some statements your candidates are making. And if you use this handy QR code, which I am pointing to with this uh, moving arrow, you'll be able to have all those resources in one place. Next slide, please. So if you are looking to help get out the word about the elections, I'm pleased to share that the League is um, doing a yard sign campaign. So if you would like a nonpartisan vote yard sign uh, with a QR code to vote 411 for your yard or the window of your apartment, um, these are for sale on our website. And I'll ask uh, uh, Sam to drop a link to those in the chat. Um, again, these are nonpartisan. They do not endorse any kind of candidate. They just encourage and empower voters to vote on election day. And we encourage you to order those by April 15th to ensure that they will get to you by the May primary. Next slide. So now we will move to the Q&A portion of our event. And I'm just gonna pull up a couple of questions here. Um, so we have a great question here to start. Um, someone asked, why do you think people don't vote as often in municipal elections when they are so important as demonstrated uh, by by our presentation. So Rochelle, Crystal, would you like to weigh in on that? Why do you think that voters aren't as engaged in municipal primaries as other elections? Um, I can start. Uh, I think that they're just not as sexy. You're uh, talking about trash removal is not as sexy. Now, what has happened, fortunately or unfortunately, because of school board issues, and because of election administration issues, I am hopeful that more people will come out because they will see the connection between their day-to-day -day lives, their community, the direction of their leadership, that they'll say, yes, I should come out um, and make my voice heard in these elections. You know, one of the things that um, most of us have taken for granted is that these folks that are doing all the problem solving in our communities don't really get the support of the community when only 20 or 30% of us come out to say, we want you to be our leader. So I'm hoping that people will become more engaged because of some of the issues that are out there. Absolutely. We have another great question. Um, Shirley is asking for clarification on what a row office is and also what it means to cross file. Rochelle, do you want to reiterate a row office and also a cross filing? What does sure. that mean? So a row offices is kind of a term of art in municipal government. Um, it is, I would refer to them as more of the executive branch folks. The council members or commissioners, they're legislating. The row offices like the DA, the county controller, the clerk of judicial records, the coroner, they're not making policy. They're carrying out certain very important responsibilities for the community, but they're not policy makers. Uh, the way your council, your commissioners, your supervisors are. In terms of cross-filing, once again, because we have this closed primary system in Pennsylvania, 
most of our candidates in municipal elections, if they're a Democrat, they can just be on the Democrat ballot. If they're Republican, they can only be on the Republican ballot. There are a few positions, as I said, school board, common pleas court judge, and magisterial districts that have been given through state legislation, our election code, the opportunity to be on the other party's ballot. So that if you have a democratic judicial candidate for the Court of Common Pleas, that person, if that person gets enough signatures on their ballot petition signed, can be also on the Republican ballot and vice versa. What this does not permit is third party and independent candidates. They will not appear on any ballot in the primary. However, after the primary, until I believe sometime in August, but I could be wrong, I'd have to check that out if anybody's interested. They get nomination papers signed, and if they get a sufficient number of signatures, they will appear on the general election ballot. So I hope that answers that question. Definitely. Um, we have another great question that I think would be great for Crystal to answer. Um, Crystal, someone asked, how can we best engage our communities to get people excited about local elections? I think maybe as a, you know, someone who lives in community, former organizer, maybe you have some perspective on this, how to get people excited about, you know, these really local, hyper-local elections. I really love to um, ask people what matters to them. And really when it comes down to it, you, you will see people will mention their families, their schools, um, their communities, their neighborhoods. And um, whenever these conversations happen, we just, it's, it's so clearly um, comes up that these little local, these little, these local elections are actually ones that are having the most direct impact on these, on these aspects of your lives that uh, matter to you the most day to day. So um, I, I know everybody wants to say, I don't care about politics. I, that's not what I, that's not what I get involved in. But like, you know, you, you, whether or not like your, your kid's school is being funded well enough, whether or not like the, how the courts are being run, you know, that you, you have to um, vote every year, not just in, you know, our, our major, our major years. So really just asking people what matters to them really helps um, people act like connect the dots. It's like, you might, you might say you don't care about politics, but truly what you care about does translate and you do care. I couldn't agree more, Crystal, thank you. Um, and another question that I think would be um, good for you to answer, Crystal, we have a, a question from Teresa who asked, um, for elderly folks who move to retirement communities in their same counties, um, but retain a home address, do they need to re-register and submit a change of address? Crystal or, or Rochelle? I mean, I would say yes. I mean, if if you if you moved from um, where you, if you're living in a whole new spot, you got to update that voter registration. Um, it's perfectly fine if some people have like a different mailing address, but if you're living somewhere different, you got to update that. Yes, I agree. You should check your uh, registration, the address, and um, it could also affect where you're going to vote. So it's, it's very important to update your voter registration. Agreed. Um, could, could one of you also talk about just the process for, for students? Um, you know, we have a lot of you know, young interns and fellows that come to work for the league, for example, um, who aren't sure you know, the, the process for, you know, should I register at my college address? Should I register at my home address? Um, how does the process work and how do they, you know, choose which one to be registered at? Any, any thoughts on that? Um, and, and Crystal's uh, closer in age than I certainly am to young people. But what I've been told is the process that uh, a college educated individual or person going to college um, goes through is where am I gonna be on election day? If I think I can get home, I will register at my home address. 
if I'm six hours away and there's no way I'm going to get home, I will register at my uh, college address. I don't know, Crystal, what, what do you think? I have always encouraged people, if you move out of state, you know, you move somewhere new for school, that's where you're going to be for the next four years. And what, what happens locally is going to impact you right then and there. Um, so I know a lot of folks like to try to retain, but I think if you are existing in a new, in a new county, a new city, new state, um, there, there are going to be all of these different elections that are going to directly impact your time while you're there. So definitely encourage um, college students to update the registration to wherever they're studying. That makes a lot of good sense. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. But again, it's been 15 years since I've been that age. So good point. I'm going to remember that one. Definitely. And um, Jean Weston in the chat also just mentioned that regarding college kids, you know, you can register at home, but have your mail ballot sent to your college. So requesting an absentee ballot for your home county is, is, a, is a good point. Um, great. Well, I have one uh, final question. Um, and if anyone has anyone, any additional, we still have about five minutes left of Q&A. But um, Rochelle, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to just the process for becoming a poll worker, um, what is involved, um, maybe speak to the fact that, you know, it's paid. Um, it's a great opportunity to su support democracy, um, the resources that are available, anything, anything you want to share. <laughs> oh, wow. So you uh, said most of it. But I think that's a lead into the League of Women Voters is, has, is in partnership with the Committee of 70 to recruit poll workers. And all you need to do, and I don't know whether there's a link in the chat, is to get on the League's website. And if you're interested at all, what the League will do is send your information to your county voter registration, they will reach out to you to be a poll worker. But the other things that the league is doing for anyone interested in being a poll worker is to provide information sessions. They are, so you wanna be a poll worker? Here's what it entails. Then there is a very, I will call granular, giving you what the day in the life of a poll worker is. And then another session, just Q&A with other poll workers, uh, experienced people as to what it's like to be a poll worker. It's a phenomenal program. I went through it last year and it helped me tremendously. But being a poll worker is just such a gratifying um, experience. You're in your neighborhood, you're seeing your neighbors, they're excited about voting. You're excited that they are voting. So I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I, I highly recommend it. It's a long day. I'm not going to say it's not. Uh, we start at six. And until the votes are counted and the voting machine is locked up tight, it could be till nine or 10 at night. But um, I got to tell you, my experience has been more than positive. You're working with a great team of people and um, everybody is supportive of each other. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, I, I agree. And I did drop our, our uh, poll worker project information in the chat if anyone is interested in learning more. Um, we just had a great comment from Jeff Greenberg, who is a county former county election official and a, a colleague of ours at the Committee of 70. Um, and he wanted to just add that, you know, just to clarify that um, with regard to the, the person moving into an, um, an elder care facility, um, that someone who maintains ownership of their home can retain their voter registration at that address, even if they are a long-term care facility. You know, same thing with students. Um, many voted, many folks want to continue to vote in the races that they have voted for in their, their, tire, their entire lives, which I, I totally understand and, and, and appreciate. So thanks for flagging that, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Great. All right, um, let me just check the, oh, we have one more question about poll workers from Lynn who asked, can poll workers sign up for a half day rather than a whole day? <laughs> uh, I will tell you not in Lehigh County. Um, I don't know what uh, Jeff's experience was, 
when he was involved in his county, but I'm not, I, I don't know what the, 60, the 66 other counties do. Um, it's, I think it's very rare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, Jeff agrees that it's, it's but, but I will, I will tell you, um, that there's typically, um, a team of five or six and we spell each other. There are down times in uh, during primary, even general election where you can spell each other. So it's not that you're standing there or sitting there for this length of time and you can't get a break. Yeah, for sure. And we've got some great feedback in the chat that in Montgomery County and Bucks County, you can also do a half day. So I definitely encourage everyone to, to reach out, you know, to their local county election offices and, and check the websites and, and see what's available because yeah, a half day sounds a lot better. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Um, well, with that, um, Crystal, I just invite you if you want to share any final thoughts or reflections before Rochelle um, offers us just our final resources. Yeah, I was just thinking about that first question about like why people don't vote. And uh, I think there's a lot of confusion around it. And I'm just so grateful to the League of Women Voters for putting on this web series to dispel some of that confusion. Um, and I am super excited to work with the League um, and on the different chapters across Pennsylvania and hope that y'all be able to reach out to vote writers and see us as a resource. So thank you so much. Absolutely. We, we are really appreciative of this partnership as well. Crystal, you do such important work for voters. So thank you for being here. Rochelle, would you like to close us out? And sure. Tori, you can change yeah. the slide, please. So uh, Meg mentioned Vote 411. So we wanted to show you a picture of it and show you just how easy it is. This year, because these are municipal elections, the local leagues, and there are a lot of local leagues on the on the call tonight are going to be putting this together for you and putting in all of your, I won't say all of the races, but most of the races that will be on your ballot. So you see, all you have to do is put your name and address in, hit the submit button and you will get the information that you need to learn about your candidates. And not only will you get the listing and biographical information about your candidates, but the leagues will be posing questions to them to answer. And these questions will be geared toward the position that they're running for. So you'll get some granular information about what your candidates' priorities are, what their positions are. So it's an invaluable tool. Next slide. So we talked about how this year we are focusing on municipal elections. So on April 4th, we are going to do a deep, deep dive into school board elections. Susan Spica, who is the executive director of Education Voters of Pennsylvania, will be our presenter. And I know anybody that is interested in school board elections, you should encourage, encourage to join us. Next slide. After that, we are going to, on May 1st, talk about our closed primaries system. Diana Dakey, who is with the League of Women Voters of Lackawanna County and very much involved in ballot PA, and independent Pennsylvanians is going to talk to us once again in a deep dive about the primary coming up and our primary system. I also wanna make a little plug today. I got confirmation from Deborah Gross of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, who is going to be doing a webinar for us in September, October, we haven't decided on the judiciary and the judicial elections. And then Pat Christmas from the Committee of 70 will be doing a deep dive on all of the municipal government offices, what their authority is, what their responsibilities are. So stay tuned, join us, and you will be ready to go 
for these municipal elections. So I think that's the last slide. And thank you very much. Our fight for the vote never stops. I wish you all a good evening. Somebody's asking about links in the chat. Shirley, we'll be sending out an email to all the registrants tomorrow, which will include all of the links in the chat. So you'll get you'll get an email tomorrow with all of those links. Great. No problem. Just uh, waiting for everyone to uh, leave. Sorry, you can unshare the slides. I'm gonna manually remove people. <laughs> I think people are have us on in the background while they're making dinner. <laughs> yeah, I think we ended up with 42 folks. Yeah, we did. Wow. We had 60 to start. So oh, really? people, people <laughs> turned in and tuned out, I guess. All right, it's just us. Thank you so much. That was a really wonderful event. Super smooth. Everyone did a great job. Yeah, I thought.